My name is Andreas Gestrich. I'm the director of the Institute. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to um, have you all here uh, for this opening of an exhibition on, for the, on the commemoration of the uh, fall of the wall and uh, 25 years ago. Um, mem remembering East Germany's peaceful revolution 25 years later. And, sorry, is that, yeah. And it's my first pleasure really to thank Molly Andrews, who is uh, the driving force behind it. It all goes back to a project she did uh, in 90, started in 1990 with interviews of uh, activists of the dissident movement of the time and uh, having re-interviewed them 20 years and more later as a political uh, psychologist here at uh, um, the University of East London. I think this is a really extremely interesting uh, approach and project to this long-term uh, view on what it actually meant on a personal level. And she cooperated then with several other people and uh, it turned also um, into the, inter or you integrated photographers and uh, artists to create on the basis of the interview or around the interviews an exhibition. And it's my uh, pleasure to thank Birgit Schmidt uh, who cooperated on the interviews and the translation of the interviews and Stefan Walter who did the, um, um, the, was the designer for the exhibition, Barbara Droth who uh, is the uh, author of the film which we are going to see and um, uh, Warren Meltzer and Christoph Ox who were also uh, um, involved in the exhibition. Um, we are going to have this event in two parts, uh, two panel debates. The first uh, um, chaired by Dorothee Wehrling. Dorothee Wehrling is an expert in uh, GDR history, having written extensively also on the oral history. Uh, she was involved in a project um, uh, which started even before the end uh, of the GDR. And um, uh, the second uh, um, uh, panel will be chaired by Jens uh, Brockmeier. And uh, in between, we will see the film, uh, the video by Barbara Droth. Um, it's, perhaps I can say just a few words. Uh, I had a very curious uh, uh, experience not very long ago. I was in India at the beginning of the month and I spent uh, the evening of our uh, national holiday, the 3rd of October, uh, being invited uh, in the embassy, uh, German embassy in New Delhi. And uh, they have a wonderful park, uh, subtropical garden. And in this park, when one entered the, uh, entered the garden, there was uh, about 10, 15 meter high model of the television tower, uh, the, uh, the Funkturm am Alexanderplatz, and the garden was divided by a big wall, uh, uh, polystyrene of course, and uh, the ambassador who was in fact uh, in 89 in, in the Prague embassy in uh, quite influential or uh, in the, in the um, events in, in Prague, in, or involved in the events in Prague. Um, of course, then after his speech, asked the rhetorical question, uh, who's brought the wall down? Was it the politicians? No. Uh, was it the military? No. Uh, who was it? Us, the people, of course. And then you had this wonderful uh, incident where a uh, very colorful population in saris, Indian, uh, uh, brought the wall down. <laughs> And uh, so it's, it's we the people. Uh, but the political iconography, and that's the real, really interesting thing about it, is changed. Uh, once the wall was taken down, the base of the uh, wall was turned into a catwalk and it, it immediately turned into an, a German India fashion show. Uh, so, 
uh, we can see from that incident uh, the, new, the place of that particular moment as a sort of a political icon being turned into, into a sort of nation branding. Uh, it, it has become part of the, the branding of the new, new Germany. I think what we're going to see today will be radically different. And we will see, uh, we'll learn a lot about the things that happened before uh, that particular date, and we will learn a lot about uh, what it meant for the people then in the, in the subsequent decades. Uh, but that is the field of Molly Andrews, who will now introduce you to her project. Sorry, I, I have to make, a, I should have done that first, uh, an announcement about these, uh, these items. You probably have discovered it already. Uh, we have simultaneous translation because the debate will be uh, the panel discussion in German. You can later on ask in, in English and it will be translated. Um, please don't put these things in your pockets because they are infrared and if you put them away uh, you will lose contact. But and if you press the program number one is, um, I think, into English, and number two is translation into German, and zero is just the ordinary noise uh, in the room. I think that's the most important things, and uh, then now I hand over. Okay. Um, yes, well, first of all, Andreas, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm just going to say a few words here because um, after this symposium, when we go downstairs, we're going to, uh, Birgit Schmidt and I are going to say a few words about what it's meant to be doing this project over 20 years. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, but before I do that, actually, I just wanted to start by really thanking um, the German Historical Institute because actually, um, I, although I thought our project is immensely rich and fascinating and very, very interesting and something that everybody must be interested in. In fact, when I went to try to find a public place to put on an exhibition, um, I have to say nowhere did I get the kind of reception that we had here. And immediately, um, I would like to also acknowledge Angela Schatner, who has just been absolutely wonderful, helping to coordinate every aspect of this exhibition. But between her and Andreas, they were extremely not only welcoming, but also very, very generous and fulsome in their support of wanting to host this. So thank you very much to them. Um, I also have to say a few thank yous, um, which really acknowledge the help that I've had through the years. Um, the first of those needs to be uh, Wolfgang Edelstein at the Max Planck Institute. Um, I, never, I never was able to get a, a grant to do this project, and yet for reasons that I will talk about later, I was absolutely consumed by the need to do it. And I sort of was able to patchwork quilt together a way of making this possible. But the first person to give any actual support was Wolfgang Edelstein, who actually the first bit of support came in the form of cassettes. And that shows you how long ago this was. He actually gave, you know, endless amounts of cassettes and, a, um, and an office at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. And he continued to be and is and does continue to be a real support of this project. Um, in the phase two of the project, um, it, the support came from the Wissenschaftszentrum of Berlin and also my home institution, the University of East London, which um, was very generous in its support, not least in the wonderful, wonderful portraits of von Melzer, who you will see, whose work you'll see downstairs. So. That, that, that is the sort of institutional thank you. Um, before I let us get on to the real events of the day, I just want to say how personally touching it is for me to look out and to see, it's almost like this is your life, okay? You know, this, the old fashioned TV show where I see different people from different parts of this project. Most importantly, and most strikingly, I have to say, Sebastian Flugbeil, Annette Simon, and Reiner Weissen, who are three of the 15 people who have just given so 
very, very generously of their time. The three of them I have only really ever seen in their own living rooms. For hours and hours and hours, they let Birgit and I stay in their living rooms. So that you have come to London and that you are here is just, it's really wonderful and it, and it means a lot to me. And um, I have no doubt that we are really in for a very, very interesting afternoon of discussion, especially if the tea upstairs is anything to go by. It's going to be very uh, animated indeed. So um, with that said, um, and again, thank you to Dorothy and, and Jens. Um, thank you very much, and let's get on. Sorry. John, can you hear me? Yes. I I wish you a very warm welcome to the first round of discussion here. And we agreed that in the first round of discussion, we should mainly talk about how the three witnesses at their panel, how they experienced the time just uh, prior to the fall of the war, so the autumn of 1989, and also the consequences, how they lived through them, how they experienced it themselves. So that's the intention of the first panel. The second panel uh, that is going to be moderated by Jens Brockmeyer. We are going to talk about collective memory and um, public interpretation and such matters. And so you know, there are two different stages to this discussion here. I would like to in briefly introduce the three panelists. In your programs, you have short biographies, so you can read up on it later on if you wish. So for this panel, we've got an hour. And if it's possible, then we will also have a question and answer session after that, so you can ask questions or make your own contribution. Let me briefly introduce with the oldest member, with uh, Sebastian Plupa, sitting, sitting next to me on the right-hand side. He was born in 1947, and in the GDR he worked as a physicist. He became a political activist in the 1980s in the peace movement and also on environmental issues in 1989. He was one of the founders of the New Forum at one of the first major movements of the opposition and he also represented the New Forum at the Round Table. You might remember that the Round Table was and was set up where various opposition groups and the existing GDR government met and were then negotiated about the future of the GDR, to put it quite in quite general terms. Then Ein Advaisson on my left was born in 1951. He worked in the GDR as an architect and urban planner. In the middle of the 1970s, he met opposition op uh, opponents and he was also one of the founders of the Initiative for Peace and Human Rights, one of the major opposition groups in the, former, in the GDR. And he was also for the EFM, for this group. He was also a participant of the round table discussions. And finally, Annette Simon, sitting next to me, the youngest participant, born in 1952, she grew up, you might, some of you might know, she was the, she's the daughter of Christian Gerd Wolf, and she grew up in an environment that has been marred by critical but loyalty to the GDR, you might say. She opted, she opted for a different method. She didn't become a member of the party of the SED. She, got in, she was very interested in the Prague Spring, and since 1971 or in the 1970s, he has been, she has been working as a psychotherapist in Berlin. She worked then in a hospital in Berlin. In 1989, she also joined the new forum, so the um, collective movement of, of um, the opposition. So the others, these are the three panelists. And I would like to start with my first question with you, Annette, if I may. What I find interesting, and what certainly the audience would find interesting as well, how many of the, how did you experience autumn 1981, and what's your experience of the autumn 89? How did you experience the fall of the Berlin Wall? Maybe 
I think I need to consider the whole of the year 1989 because in spring 1989, I, pl I was planning to leave the GDR with my husband and finally to say goodbye to the state. And then I met an acquaintance from the opposition in the street and he said, stay until the autumn because things might happen. Things might change. That might not was not the only reason why we stayed. Also, our own emotions, our own anxiety, anxiety anxieties to leave were a reason. So we did stay. And since May, when the elections took place that had been rigged, it was clear that things were happening. Then. Uh, very at a very early stage, we joined the new forum. We both joined the new forum. And then, so autumn 89 was an incredibly fascinating, captivating time where you couldn't fall asleep anymore. And especially in the night of when the wall came down, we were so tired, so extremely tired because of all of our activities. My husband made the was responsible for the newspaper of new forum on the day I myself um, I had was um, chaired an assembly at the clinic and then that evening we heard the wall had been opened and neither of us really believed it let's go to sleep let's have a good night's sleep so we'll see tomorrow what is going to happen and that was also the first reaction, our, our initial reaction when we were members of the opposition. Why is it opening so quickly? This is the vengeance of the Politburo so that we cannot bring about major changes. And also shortly afterwards, one of the first assemblies took place of the new forum. And then not so many members were here because they had to go west, first of all. So the first impression was, what's happening now? Everybody's leaving, going to the west. And we cannot bring about the changes that we want to bring about. Of course, that had changed because we were also very excited, very euphoric to go to, Ber to West Berlin for the first time. Do you want me to carry on? You. So in retrospect, the whole history of 1989 is completely different compared to the time when it actually happened. And in retrospect, you know things much better that the GDR was going to break down, that this would lead to German unification, etc. But at the time when it happened, nothing was clear. Nothing was obvious. So the pressure that was exerted on the SED, on the government, of course, was increasing. That's correct. And from various directions, those who wanted to, who left the GDR, who went to the um, to West German embassies and other methods, and when demonstrations were being staged, and there was less repression, that is, the Stasi couldn't keep up with the pace. They couldn't keep up. There was just too much to cope with for the Stasi, for the secret police. But the dynamics, the revolutionary dynamics, if I may call it that, that happened on the 7th of October 1989, on the 40th anniversary of the GDR, and then it was clear there's no, you can't stop this movement, but that such a dramatic event or this dramatic change at that moment in time only was clear then and um, at the latest on the 9th, 9th of October, not November, 9th of October 1989, it was clear to us that the SED had lost its cause. And then you needed to do something about it. And that's what we, we tried to act. Again, then my question would be, when the wall came down, and Netta has just told us that she had very, she had very ambivalent emotions, how did you feel the same? Can you please elaborate on that? Ambivalent means 
I must clearly say, the fall of the wall, for me personally, and was the most important event of my life. And that didn't just apply to, our, to me, but for 16 million people at once. That, of course, that for itself, you don't need a great deal of imagination how dramatic this was for all of us. And, of course, it was a moment of euphoria. I experienced the whole of the wall live on site. I still live 200 meters away from Bornholmerstraße, from the border crossing where the, first, the wall first came down. And I was there myself. I was so, I was so surprised at that, that <coughs> evening that so many people went there. And also in place, normally there wouldn't be that many people in the street. So I went to the border crossing as well myself. And when I saw it, I couldn't go west. I was uh, terrified. I stopped. And then I turned around and went back home. And then I started crying for hours. So it was just a shock. <laughs> but um, other parts of this ambivalence, as Annette has just mentioned, next day, or in the next few days, my comment would be, the <laughs> Politburo prefers to hand over the GDR to coal than to uh, the people, to us. <laughs> Mr. Flugbein, please can you come closely to the mic? Um, I would also like to elaborate. In 1988-1989, in the GDR, a great deal happened. One thing that was important to me was the ecumenic, the Christian gathering. So it was a meeting of all, politi oh, of all religious directions in the GDR where the first time we didn't talk about religion as such, which would have been normal, but where a major part of the social problems of the Judea were being debated at, in church setting. I was a counselor of a working group dealing with energy problems, so nuclear power and energy policy in such matters. And a lot of people who took part in this meeting were also pa part of the events of the autumn 1989. And then the most, my most important experience of autumn 1989 might be that the fact that within a very short span of time, within a few weeks, matter of few weeks, to you could tangibly feel as to how a great a part of the population changed its behavior. It became, it, you could speak openly to each other. You could say what you didn't like about this state, what you would like to change, and you were also thinking about what your own contribution might be. You, you would meet with friends. And that is a kind of situation that I cannot forget. So in October 1989, we went to work quite normally, and then went home in the evening, and then you were flat. Your home would be full of um, foreign, complete um, foreigners. They were waiting for, have been waiting for us, wanted to interview us. And the children, well, our children were young at the time and were make a, making tea for those people and waited for us to come home. And then we were talking up and until late into the night. And lots of these visitors that we didn't know before, they had. Uh, we realized also that we spoke openly for the first time to people that we didn't know, and it was wonderful. If I now picture 
that a family that uh, children let uh, strangers come into their flats, then you can imagine how unusual it was. But that was what happened. And so the change in behavior of the people at the time in the GDR was something that I found particularly moving. Also, when people gathered in, the, in churches, pe uh, churches that used to be empty before, when they started gathering there, then all of a sudden, somebody, a complete stranger, used to go to the front and address the people and said exactly the right things. I'm not going to forget that. Something, something was happening there. Something was moving there. And nobody would have thought that would be possible. And then, in a mere few weeks, the uh, government changed several times. It became clear that it really was a very far-reaching revolution. There was far-reaching change. The Stasi, the secret police, uh, were no longer shown to be up to the job, and, and uh, it was a very peaceful revolution. And then the 9th of November came. Uh, the wall fell. And in the evening, we were at a meeting. It was very late. It was on uh, education in the GDR. We were dead tired when we came home in the evening, and we'd realized that at the meeting, people were gradually leaving. Um, it wasn't usual. We didn't give it too much thought, and uh, we were so tired, we fell into bed. About 2 o'clock in the morning, a journalist from Jerusalem phoned me and asked me what I thought about the fact that the Berlin Wall was open. And then I switched on the television, and I have to say that my spontaneous reaction Well, it became immediately clear to me that citizens in the GDR, their, their eyes had been opened, if you like. They, they w wanted to begin and to do something constructive, uh, and, and that came to an end from one minute to the next, and once the wall had fallen... We acted as if nothing had happened, and then the round tables were set up. If I may just uh, interject, because this, in fact, uh, links quite neatly into my next question. I wanted to ask... Is, uh, can everybody understand? Yes, everything's fine. Thank you. Now, all three speakers have explained in their own words in various ways that with the fall of the wall, part of this euphoria, part of this feeling of, of, uh, of freedom, of, of, of taking control of your own destiny, uh, and, and that, that there was a very clear break through the fall of the wall, if I've understood you all correctly. But at the same time, a great deal more happened in terms of the of discussions later. I wanted to come to the round table discussions, but before then, a more general question, if I may. There was a new situation in place. Uh, something new was happening every day, and so I imagine that for you, well, you must have had many wishes, ideas, fantasies of what you wanted for yourselves, what you wanted for society, ideas you had for the future, plans you had for the future, and how you might put those into action. And I think that the round table was perhaps one place where an attempt was made uh, for that. I'd like to ask all three of you, the wall was coming down. Now, What kind of a future did you want to see in those circumstances? He's just going to have an opportunity to, to continue now. What the new forum brought together over the course of a mere few weeks, uh, 250,000 people 
wanted to be involved in it. It simply couldn't work in practical terms. But what encouraged people to get involved was the simple, harmless wish for a dialogue. They wanted to speak to the people in power. We didn't want a revolution. We didn't want uh, anyone to be killed. Uh, uh, what we wanted was a real dialogue. And once the wall was open, we, we attempted to conduct that dialogue. And in Eastern Europe, they had this model of the round table discussions. So that's something that we put into practice. And we tried to talk to one another. On the one hand, the old parties, the bloc parties from the GDR, and on the other side, the opposition people, and uh, it was moderated by the church. Now, it was a very heated uh, discussion about all manner of, of problems and issues. In practical terms, it didn't lead to all that much. but. We spoke to one another, eye to eye. Uh, we sat down and, and we spoke openly with one another, uh, with people that we'd avoided discussion with in the past. And if I think back to my considerations at the time, well, I didn't give that much thought to preparing for reunification wasn't really on the agenda as far as I was concerned. What I was trying to do, to look at the areas that I understood and that were important for me, and to try to raise critical questions during the discussion, and to try and change the course somewhat. I, I was relatively modest, really, in my, in my uh, wishes. In, in some respects, it worked, and in others, it didn't at all. But that lasted for several months, and it really generated its own dynamism, and, and it, uh, in fact, gathered speed and, and, and ran away from us to a certain extent. And, and suddenly we, we were at reunification, and the management of that process is something that was then increasingly taken over by the West German side, and that really left uh, a bitter aftertaste. But that's typical in a revolution. The people that began it, uh, in fact, benefit the least from it in the end. Yes, I wanted a democratic GDR. It was my wish that the GDR becomes a different country because the people were there that wanted to make the country a different one. We really weren't thinking of unification initially. But then it happened, and what we did want to see, of course, was the freedom to travel. That suddenly was possible, and that was really quite overwhelming in, in every respect. I think the decisive point when we realized that everything will happen quite differently was when it came to the elections in March 1990. They were the first free elections, and new forum uh, was up for election the other uh, groups as well and we were expecting to get about 50 percent and what were we uh, all together five percent so we were a, a very small minority and that feeling of disillusionment that became clear through those elections that's something that we really had to come to terms with it was a very lengthy process to do that and to come to terms with the fact that the, G the population of the GDR didn't vote for us. They wanted something else and in, in that moment, but essentially I think they didn't really know what they wanted. But it was clear that the path would be a different one and we all had to come to terms with that, the uh, GDR opposition. And it, it was, a, it was a, a hard path. It was, it, was, it was very difficult to come to terms with because it was clear that there would be one Germany, and, and what would our place be in that one Germany? <coughs> yes. Well, similarly to as Annette has just described, I would also say that we wanted to overcome the, social, uh, the socialist GDR in the favor of a democratic state based on the rule of law. And 
the pressure on reunification or unification uh, that, uh, of course, there's nothing to say qualitatively against that. There, there was really that pressure there. Uh, and that was in advance of the, uh, uh, of the elections, uh, before the roundtable discussions. And so the roundtable uh, aims really had to be modified as they went along because circumstances changed. But what did remain at the time, uh, whether or not you were taking account of, of unification or not, were the circumstances that we had to find an orderly way of reaching that conclusion, and that could only be done through a democratically legitimate government uh, to represent us and to do that. We needed to have democratic elections to prepare for those. That was one of the main tasks of the round table from the outset. It is something that the round table managed. The election was the first noni democratic uh, election that ever took place in the GDR. The second part that hasn't yet been touched on and it, in fact it became obsolete through unification was uh, a democratic constitution of, for the GDR and the round table was to produce a draft constitution for the GDR. <coughs> so there were various working groups and uh, a large number of, of draft bills were worked on by the round table and all of those uh, were to be taken on by the People's Chamber because they decided that uh, these would be recommendations put by the round table and that they would become legislation. It was, it was really quite a paradoxical situation because both bodies were not democratically elected. It wasn't possible. The People's Chamber, of course, wasn't, and the round table wasn't democratically elected either. But these two bodies had to work together to, to establish some form of legitimacy. So it, it was all a little strange, but it did work somehow in practice. Then there were the elections. The citizens' movement had 5%, the SDP, that also came from October 1989. It was established then. It was also on the opposition side, and they had a little over 20%. They also thought they would gain an absolute majority. And then there was the elected People's Chamber. They continued working on draft legislation and uh, the timings for the unification and for the economic and monetary union that, that was established earlier than that uh, had to be brought forward. <coughs> because there was a great deal of pressure uh, on the part of, of the people that, that um, increased as time went on. That's a different point. Yes, I think that's a very important uh, point. I think a lot of people remember, it's, if you look into the historical events, what comes out is that a majority of the population of the GDR opted for unification. And as they saw it, the, it, was, it was entirely rational. It was in, the interests, in, in their interests. And I think there was a great deal of disillusionment, as you said, Annette, because at the same time it became clear that within the GDR, uh, well, it was, it was a very unique uh, population, a very, very unique situation. Now I have a final question for all of you. Looking back now, 25 years later, if you look back once again at your own experience, once again, perhaps you could tell us something about the historical circumstances at the time that, that as you saw them and, and what you made of them how what you were able to achieve given those circumstances what were you able to achieve in terms of your personal and political goals your wishes for the future do you believe 
that the events that occurred in some way corresponded to what you wanted to see in, in personally and politically. Would you like to continue, perhaps, or make a start on these questions? Well, during this revolution and up until unification, I didn't, I wasn't really able to develop any fixed ideas for my own personal future. Everything happened far too quickly. There was uh, so much to be done on a day-to-day -day basis. There was so much changed. But something came out of it almost by itself in that there was a de facto political result. I was working in the People's Chamber and then in the Bundestag. And I essentially continued with what I'd begun with the Peace and uh, Human Rights Initiative uh, five years previously in the GDR and also uh, within an international framework. The contacts that I had uh, in Eastern Europe, of course, at the time, and, and I was working for human rights to uh, ensure human rights to strengthen uh, civil society, not professional uh, politics as such, but uh, to encourage the participation of civil society. Um, and so that's something that I've, I've continued to until today. As far as I'm concerned, I can tell you that unfortunately I'm less of a political animal today than I was then. Of course, I'm still very interested in politics, but I couldn't join a party. I, I simply couldn't stay, take that step to join a political party. And so I invested very heavily in my career, and that's the opportunity that I had thanks to reunification of Germany. So I was able to study uh, psychoanalysis and, and to become a, a psychoanalyst, something that had always been a dream of mine, and I, I'd uh, looked at it in the past, but it's something that simply wasn't feasible in practice in the GDR because it uh, psychoanalysis was banned in, in the GDR. So I went down that route in my career, although I would stress that I look very much at uh, relations within society. So there is a, a GDR side to, to my work, to my approach, if you like. I look at, try and look, take account of, of society and societal aspects in, in my work and to see how that can be included in my thoughts and in, in people's approach to life. So you have the uh, <laughs> penultimate word, Sarah. I, of course, have to have the final word. Well, this one's difficult. My main area of interest was the use of uh, nuclear power uh, in military terms and uh, for peaceful means as well before 1989. During the revolution, as well in those few weeks that I was a minister at the start of 1990, I saw very highly confidential uh, files and I copied them. We then published those highly confidential files and that showed that the nuclear power stations in the uh, GDR should all be uh, decommissioned in 1990. And then I allowed myself to be uh, drawn into the political sphere and I spent a few years in Berlin as an MP uh, representing the new forum. And that gave me a degree of insight uh, into politics from the inside. And it uh, wasn't all that appetizing, I have to say, so I'm quite pleased that I'm out of there now. Today, well, for many years now, I've been president of a society for radiation protection. 
so we're the opposition in that sector in Germany, if you like. And my experience has shown that the opponents that we have in a reunified Germany, that they are much cleverer and much more uh, evil, if you like, than, than we could ever have imagined, and that we managed to achieve far less than we did in the final years of the GDR, and, and that really is somewhat depressing.